Welcome to episode three of GTV or Grief TV, a video podcast about grief and its various manifestations uh, in our lives. Um, for this episode, I interviewed Margaret Pabst Batten, also known as Peggy Batten, um, also known as one of my personal heroes and someone who I just have so much fun with when we're in the same place and and you know i just want to talk to her forever we have been known to have you know hours long conversations we can just go and go and go and go um uh, i'm never good at giving intros while i have the person with me and i kind of made peggy give her own intro but i'm gonna give you the formal one anyway um because Peggy's pretty incredible. Um, Margaret Pabst Batten, nicknamed Peggy, as we said, is a distinguished professor of philosophy and an adjunct professor of internal medicine uh, at the Program in Medical Ethics and Humanities at the University of Utah. She graduated uh, from Bryn Mawr, has an MFA in fiction writing and a PhD in philosophy from uh, University of California at Irvine. Um, She's won prizes for her short stories. Uh, she was the recipient of the University of Utah's Distinguished Research Award. She's authored, co-authored, edited, co-edited, uh, I think over 20 books, um, many having to do with ethics, um, the least worst death, suicide, uh, physician aid in dying. Uh, she has done some research on quote, active euthanasia and assisted suicide in the Netherlands. Um, you know, anything, any, anything in that um, realm. And she won, uh, in 2000, she received the Rosenblatt Prize, the University of Utah's most prestigious award. And she was named Distinguished Honors Professor in 2002, 2003. Um, she's awesome. Uh, she also worked closely with the American Association of Suicidology on its statement uh, about it, it, its its uh, its position piece. I can't I can't I don't have words uh, on its position piece about suicide being different from physician aid and dying. And I was lucky enough to um, also be a part of that. At, at you know Peg, with Peggy at the helm, She's currently working on three other book projects. I don't know when she sleeps. And she's known as one of the mothers of bioethics. Um, so she's real fancy. But um, I love her. And um, I think what's interesting about Peggy is that, you know, her her life, her career uh, was, I mean, it seems to me it was pretty focused in, in one area. And then it almost seems... Um, as if her life intersected, you know, that there was just a moment where they were, they met the, the professional and the personal um, in a very um, interesting and tragic way. And I wanted to hear her talk about that or anything. She could talk about anything. I will be happy with anything Peggy ever says. <laughs> um, but we had, we had a good conversation. Um, and I am looking forward to having y'all hear it and getting your feedback and, and seeing what you think. Um, this project was supposed to be moving a little more quickly than it has um, run into some scheduling issues. The spring has been so much. Um, and I, I do also want to point out that um, I fully realize it's all white people on the podcast uh, right now. Um, I am very intent on, you know, making this not just another place for white people to, to talk about the issues. Um, I've contacted, you know, a bunch of people, but it's just like, we've all been either fatigued or, or just so busy. Um, so I think this project is going to end up being a longer term project than I initially intended. And, uh, you know, I think, I think it'll work out, um, so that there's a little more representation, um, from other people, you know, other communities, because I think that's important. And I think that's what we need. Um, 
What else? Peggy, Peggy, Peggy. Mm. You can watch episodes at grieftv.com. That's grief-tv.com. Uh, we, I have a Facebook page, also Grief TV. Um, what else? I haven't made a Twitter yet. I don't know if I will, but you can find all the things there. Um, I am also happy to hear, uh, if you have suggestions for someone I could talk to, uh, that would be great, especially if you have contact information, um, feedback. I don't think I have a, 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 a form on the new website yet about reaching out, but my email address is des at livethroughthis.org. So D-E-S at L-I-V-E-T-H-R-O-U-G-H-T-H-I-S dot org. All the words spelled out, live through this. Um, what else? I've been talking for too long. I just want you to hear Peggy. I want you to hear Peggy. Um, and you will notice there is a little bit of a difference in my appearance between the intro and the episode. And that's because I am recording the intro a couple of weeks after the recording. Uh, yes. Okay. Enjoy. Enjoy, Peggy. Uh, I mean, I hate doing introductions of people and myself. Do you want to introduce yourself? So I could certainly do that. You could. I could say, by way of introduction, I've been a friend and admirer of Desiree's for a long time. That should be introduction enough, but just in the background, I could say that I've um, been a, I'm from the East Coast. I've lived in Southern California. I now live in uh, Salt Lake City. I've been a philosophy professor for something like 45 years. Can you imagine 45 years of doing the same thing? <laughs> Except that if it's something you love, 45 mm -hmm. years is pretty good. Uh, and I think of philosophy as a troublemaking discipline. You, you know, you come into the room with things that you thought you understood. And by the time the philosophers have been analyzing things, you go with if they've done their work, you go out with more questions than you came with. <laughs> um, I, well, there's a whole story there. I like to write books. I think that's the best fun in the world. Um, and I, I'm teaching. I certainly like all the conference going and communication with people in other areas. But the area I've I've um, concentrated on, I've worked on lots of issues in bioethics, my field, but the area I've been most uh, engaged in is end of life issues. So a conversation about grief seems quite in order. <laughs> it fits, it fits. It fits. So I can tell you about my first experience with grief. Yes, do it. Uh, the year is I think 1961 when there were no cell phones, we worked on manual typewriters. Um, there wasn't much in, you know, in the way of effective treatment for liver cancer, which is what my mother had and she died. Mm -hmm. So you can say this in a couple of different ways. You can say my mother died in 1961, liver cancer. And you can explain that um, we lived in Washington, D.C. at the time, my father, my sister, um, myself, and my mother. And we just happened to be close personal friends of the medical director of a very large uh, medical um, organization. So she got the best possible care. Mm -hmm. right. But, of course, it didn't work. And those were the days before the publication of Kubler-Ross's book on death and dying, the famous mm -hmm. book that made it possible to actually talk about death and dying. Mm -hmm. So in those days, nobody ever said she's dying. She mm -hmm. never said it. The doctor never said it. Nobody in the family or all the friends ever said it. 
the one thing I remember the doctor saying was, this is in the winter sometime. Oh, this is just a little downturn. You'll be up and around by spring. I think that comes under the rubric of preserving hope. Mm -hmm. She was dead by spring. So I remember when I think about it, I think of three different ways you could say this to try to capture what grief is about. You could say my mother died in the spring of 1961. You could say my mother died in the spring of 1961. This is not just any person, it's my mother. Or you could say, my mother died in the spring of 1961. Because dying, she died, was the most awful thing I could possibly imagine. So there's a lot of story in between but the fact that this most important person died, and even though she had the best possible care, the thing that she didn't have, and my takeaway, I was 21 at the time, the, the, a difficult and impress, impressionable age where things make a lot of difference, the thing that, my main takeaway from that was she didn't have a choice about how she died. Mm -hmm. I remember almost the last thing I heard her say was, why should it be so hard to die? And her death was not a particularly difficult one, but it wasn't easy either. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> but my main the thing that I took away from it is this business about having a choice about how you die. So that seemed to me, the only label I could think of this was, should she have been able to end her own life on her own terms? Those are actually more modern ways of expressing it. Or as actually happened, would she just be on the sort of standard roller coaster towards a, a perfectly ordinary cancer death. Mm. So fast forward through college, graduate school, you know, jobs as in an academic department. I've worked on end of life issues um, my entire career and especially on it was then called, or the only term I could think of was issue of suicide. Should she have had a choice? Well, there was nothing to read then. Mm -hmm. At least in the contemporary philosophic literature, I was in a philosophy department. Nothing to read anywhere. There were no, you know, California living will bills and any of the modern medical aid and dying bills, none of that had even begun. Hmm. Right. But what was there to read? Well, there's Plato. There's Aristotle. Plato on suicide says it's inappropriate in these cases, but understandable in those cases. Aristotle says uh, this is a matter of cowardice and it injures the state. Uh, the Stoics, on the other hand, said, this is the act of the wise and responsible man. Then along come the Christian uh, fathers, right? And their view is that suicide is a sin, right? Indeed, the, perhaps the gravest of sins. Uh, and then you get the um, early moderns. Uh, you get Hume and Kant, Kant and Hume. You get Nietzsche, die at the right time, don't overdo it, right? <laughs> uh, and then it gets eclipsed by 
the view that suicide is a product of um, social organization of a society, that's Durkheim, or that it's a matter of psychopathology, that's Freud. So all this issue about whether this is morally permissible, <laughs> impermissible, good or bad, or sometimes obligatory, all that goes away. And here we are in the present. And so I'm still thinking about issues in suicide and whether there are some circumstances in which it is understandable, indeed appropriate, um, mm -hmm. and others in which our ordinary um, mechanisms of suicide prevention ought to be um, invoked. So the terminology has changed a little bit. So we don't, those who favor this practice don't speak of physician aid, physician assisted suicide anymore. And we talk about medical aid in dying is the new general term. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so what's the moral of this story? It starts with my, my mother dying in 1961. I think, shouldn't she have had a choice? I have no idea of what choice she would have made, but that she should have had a choice is my um, takeaway from that. So, I've never known your origin story yeah. in that way. So that's fascinating. Yeah. Well, we're here. So there are two things about grief in this connection. One, the one I've just told is to what degree that grief has been a motivator in my life. It's actually the foundation of that, that experience, I think, is what has motivated all my interest for my entire academic career. And half of the 20 books I've been involved in, <laughs> um, all the later work and stuff I've done, is motivated by that original episode of acute mm. um, grief. I, I think the other thing about grief is that that, uh, that initial grief is how irrational it is in some ways. So ha to what degree this happens to other people, I don't know, but I realized that it's grief mixed, mis mixed with a kind of anger at the universe how could you let my mother die? She was only 51. That's not fair, right? This is, mm -hmm. right. But that anger gets displaced. Um, and my observation about the world, I have no idea whether you can generalize this, is that it gets displaced onto the next nearest person. Mm -hmm. That would be my father. So I hated my father for a whole year. Why? I had come into the room. I'd, I'd been a uh, junior abroad, and when I got back, I came, of course, to the house when they let me know that this was about to happen. And I came in, and there was my mother in bed. Uh, whether she was actually conscious or not, I don't know, or just sleeping. But there was my father sitting in an armchair next to the bed reading the newspaper. And it was the fact of reading the newspaper that provoked this reaction. How could he be reading the newspaper when she was dying? Mm -hmm. Instead of the rational thing to do would have been to say, oh, isn't that tender? Even if she isn't perhaps fully conscious now, he's sitting there with her. But uh, the irrational part, I don't know what I thought he should have been doing, but as I say, this is totally irrational. And it took a wonderful man. There is no reason at all to have this response, except that it's the displacement of some more <clears throat> universal global anger. Yeah. So there are two things about grief. One, that it can be a motivator, and two, that it can be irrational. Let me get this this tome we have that uh, 
ties into all of what you just said. It's, you know, it's a small, it's a small book. <laughs> this one. <laughs> I think I need how many more. pages is this, Peggy? No, oh, it's six or seven hundred. I can't. Seven hundred pages. <laughs> I Show remember people, people the title so they can. Uh, yes, the ethics of suicide. Well, um, it's the ethics of suicide historical sources. Historical sources, yeah. That's so that's this, so cool about it. This is what came from my initial business about reading. What could you? How could you think about the issue about suicide? Well, read Plato, read Aristotle, read the Stoics, read the early church fathers, read the you know, all the way up. And in those days, after all, this was back in the days of manual typewriters and um, rotary dial phones. All right. To, uh, if you're going to do historical research like this, so looking for the text, you had to go to interlibrary loans uh, and request the book. And a couple weeks later, it would show up. But we did have Xerox machines. So you could, by the time this project got really underway. So you'd Xerox out the relevant pages because it would be too much trouble to get hold of this book again, if you ever were interested. And you just sort of file it away in a file cabinet. So there is a file cabinet that starts a little before Plato with the early Egyptian texts, and then there's Plato, and then there's Aristotle, and then there's some Stoics and so on. And pretty soon you have a whole file drawer going from the earliest bits of Western history to the present. Then you say, hmm, that's the Western tradition. Let's look around the globe because what about Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, right? Islam, what about Confucianism? What about, and now of course there's another file drawer made in the same way. And then you say, well, wait a minute. What about all those cultures that were oral cultures, but didn't, as far as we know, have written records, or we haven't found them, or they were, you know, something happened to them? What about the um, Aztec, the Inca, the, the Maya? How about all those cultures in Africa? There were huge empires uh, with, of course, cultural practices. What about all of Oceania? What about the Northern Eskimo um, Inuit cultures? We know little tiny tidbits, just popularly, of, from these cultures. For instance, uh, it's sort of generally culturally recognized that the um, North American uh, Inuit cultures, we call, when we call them Eskimo inappropriately, <laughs> set their elders off on ice flows or um, expect them to do so. So is there any substantiation of that? You go back and try to find the early texts, which of course are papered over by Western ethnographers and explorers' own views, but still they are interesting. What about uh, heart sacrifice in those uh, Central and uh, Central American cultures? Uh, the Aztec and the Maya. Well, it was, a lot of it was involuntary, but some of it was voluntary, right? It was a privilege, right? What? Yeah. A privilege to have your heart, your live beating heart torn out of your chest and the body thrown over the edge of the, you know, um, temple there. Well, these are things that are really hard for us to understand. What about customs in Oceania where the men would, remember there's a, there were jumping places that were different for men and women, uh, different customs about um, going out to sea mm -hmm. and planning not to come back. All of that is in this book. And the really good news is this whole collection, here's the commercial, is online for free in an archive that's maintained at the University of Utah Academic Library. Mm -hmm. And it's even more intense than the book. 
That's right, because 600 pages is long enough for a print book. Uh, <laughs> the, the publisher, Oxford, cooperated with the library. And um, so there's lots more. Epicsofsuicide.lib.utah.edu. And then the whole thing is at your fingertips. Anyway, that's the, um, that was the product, the direct product of that original experience with the death of my mother. Mm. The death of my mother right, had fueled that and still fuels almost all the end of life work that I do. Right. So should we move to another occasion? Or yeah. Three? Yeah. Um, I think I brought in the two the two responses I had, which were, you know, about your origin story and um, this tome that I've got here. <laughs> I'm glad you have that tome. I know you've worked your way through at least three quarters of it. <laughs> it's got a really beautiful inscription from someone in it, so that's good. Uh, well, but it's worth looking around in there because it's oh, yeah. so interesting in the diversity of the ways in which mm -hmm. uh, different authors, different writers, and different cultures have seen this issue. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, it's we so rarely like in you know in mainstream suicide prevention which i'm over but in that that area ethics does not come up no no one wants to actually talk about ethics no and as someone who has you know i was a philosophy minor but i've forgotten all of it you know for for the most part but i've always been able to relate it back to philosophy and people are like mm. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what all that is. The part of philosophy I don't think you've forgotten at all is the troublemaking aspect. No. That is, that. make a, somebody makes a claim, let's take it apart, see what of it is supportable, what of it is just, you know, unsupported, mm -hmm. and make it. And the end result is an issue is more complex. So... Yeah. Look at 600 pages on the ethics of suicide. That wasn't in the air at all. The way we thought about suicide was that it was wrong and it should be prevented if at all possible. Period. End of story. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think our thinking is much more broad now than was the case then. Yeah. In some cases. Um yeah, I, I, yeah, I think it's deeply important to have that self-reflexivity when you're thinking about suicide and, and and loss. You know, if you don't if you don't have a sense of where you're coming from, how can you be making any changes? Right now, also the the main takeaway from reading all this stuff, you know, everything that's ever been written practically about the ethics of suicide, everywhere around the world in all time periods that are still accessible to us, right? is that you need to think more carefully about the circumstances and under which it's done. Why is this contemplated or done? What are the social pressures of various sorts? What are the social expectations? What, mm -hmm. What's the sense of responsibility to others? And that, of course, might either speak for um, prevention or for encouragement in some cultures. What about our linguistic differences? Mm -hmm. So, for instance, um, a guy straps a bomb to his chest and walks into a crowded market, detonates it. What? What do we call him? We call him a suicide bomber, right? Mm -hmm. A soldier, another guy. This one's in our army. Falls on a grenade to save his buddy. What do we call him? A hero. A hero. He has died of the same injury that in both cases was elective. But we use our most negative term for the person on the other side and the most positive term for the person on our side. Mm -hmm. So 
how do we account for that difference? So we're clearly speaking of something different from the mechanism because the mechanism of death is essentially the same in both cases, right? Um, explosive wound to the chest, right? Yeah. Anyway, yeah. so there's a lot more to think about. Is it the word suicide or the concept of suicide specifically has like 10 different words in German? Four. 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 So there's Selbstmord. Uh, that means self-murder, literally. And that term self-murder was common in English also. Uh, there's Selbsttötung, which means self-killing. Uh, and that has a different, this is often used in bureaucratic, um, uh, you know, contexts. There is something, I have to stop and think. Give me a few seconds because I've forgotten what the third one is. I know what the fourth one is. Okay. Maybe there, let's just pretend there are only three. Maybe there are only <laughs> Oh no, I know what the third one is. It's suicide. That's the Latin, Latinate form. And that's usually used in clinical contexts. Hmm. Suicide, same as suicide. Mm -hmm. So Selbstmord, self-murder, Selbsttötung, self-killing, suicide, suicide, suicide. And then you can say to a native German speaker, maybe there's some of you out there, what's oh. the fourth one? Wait, I'm having internet issues. Um, okay, it looks like we're back. So we were on the fourth one. So we're when talking about the four different terms that are used for suicide in the German language. Mm -hmm. So there's Selbstmord, that means self-murder. There's Selbsttötung, that means self-killing. There's Suicide, that's the Latinate form, suicide. And then there's a fourth one. Uh, and you can ask a whole group of native German speakers, what's the fourth one? And they'll look around a little bit and um, often not get it. It is Freit Freitod, spelled Freitod, F-R-E-I-T-O-D. It means free death. Mm. And the reason they don't get it is that that term has comparatively um, positive valences. The first three are negative, like our term suicide, but this term freitod means voluntary, free death, elective death, but still mm -hmm. self-death. Mm -hmm. So that's the only language I'm aware of in which you can have two different vocabularies for um, self-ending. Yeah. Uh, it's not possible in English. There are lots of efforts to try to construct it. There's self-deliverance. There's self, oh, who knows what else. There's euphemisms of all sorts. They're, they're not natural uh, developments within the language. Mm -hmm. And as far as I'm aware, they don't stick very well, self-deliverance. But yeah. that's essentially what this notion of Freitod, the notion of fractal is even more um, liberal than that in the sense that mm -hmm. self-deliverance means you're escaping from something. Uh, fractal means this is your elective free death choice. Mm -hmm. so, anyway. I've talked to a, a native German speaker, so I'm going to see. This is the test here. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, tell me about the next instance. So let's skip forward. This is um, the year 2008. So this is recent uh, and for me still painful. So my husband, whom I loved a great deal, and you can see that I'm speaking in the past tense already. 
Mm. So you know what happened was he was very, he was a, like me, a college professor. Uh, we had a very active intellectual life together. We had a great, wonderful travel and play life together. We had a really nifty sex life together. We had, we had a wonderful time together. Right? So he's out biking on a wonderful, crisp, late autumn afternoon. And I, I usually went with him, but uh, that day I had a cold or something and so didn't go. He's biking down the hill on his bicycle. Uphill is biking a bike racer doing sprints, mm -hmm. riding powerfully. Uh, and they collide around a blind corner. So the other guy isn't hurt. He's just tossed off his bike. Um, although his carbon fiber bike broke in half from the impact. Uh, but Brooke, my husband, apparently went forward over the handlebars. This is according to the surgeon who operated on him. Uh, rolled forward on his helmet with the body over the helmet and then back. And that's what broke his neck. So, of course, if he hadn't had the helmet, he would have had a devastating brain injury. But he had no brain injury at all. The helmet protected him. So there he is now. He was saved by, rescued by a flight nurse who happened to be jogging down the same canyon road. Mm -hmm. And there he is. A high level spinal cord injured person now uh, expected to be paralyzed from the neck down for the rest of his life, which was true. Mm -hmm. So here the story about grief is, I think, longer. And it's longer because this goes on over a period of years. So the first part of grief is when you hear this news. It said, it said I wasn't there uh, biking with him. What would I have done if I had been there? He was unconscious when this um, fully trained flight nurse came jogging along. She was not on duty. She was just out jogging. Would you have said, what's the prognosis here? Just <laughs> keep on jogging. I would have been the decider mm -hmm. for um, whether to refuse treatment or not. But of course, I wasn't there. So I first see him in the hospital um, where by now he's intubated and you know, um, supported in every other way. But that first, since our project here is talking about grief, the first part of the grief in this story is the absolute gut-wrenching feeling of intense shock. Shock that is so powerful that you, you have this kind of nausea. Mm -hmm. You can't, you can't accept it. You can't understand it. It's just, just total shock. Well, time goes on. There's an enormous amount of stress. He's in the acute, in the um, acute part of the hospital for some time. I only vaguely remember how long it was. Uh, and there was a lot of touch and go stuff at the beginning. They didn't know whether he would survive at all. He had apparently had um, sort of walking pneumonia at the time. And so breathing because a, a um, spinal cord injury that high also cuts off the uh, effect of the diaphragm in breathing. Mm. So, so he, he would have died on the spot if that um, light nurse hadn't come along. Oh. Anyway, so you think about 
coping strategies. So I want to talk about the stages of grief and also about coping strategies. Mm -hmm. So I think the first one in shock is to do what you have to do just to try to face it, right? There's, I think it's impossible to describe that. Let's just call it shock. There's some Then things evolve a little bit, and as it becomes clear that this is what's in store, a life of total paralysis, that means ventilator dependency, um, virtually no physical motion below the shoulders, tops of the shoulders. There's grief over the loss of previous activities, so travel, um, we had all kinds of travel fun. We loved going to hot springs in strange places. We loved dancing in raunchy bars wherever we could find them. <laughs> we hiked all over the place, right? We went everywhere. And of course, sex, right? Mm -hmm. It becomes not possible anymore. So one way of dealing with that was a policy on my part of don't look back mm. do not allow yourself to think about what you've lost only allow yourself to think about what is now and whether there's anything different and indeed the kind of intimacy that developed in that circumstance because here he is entirely himself from the neck up no head injury no no nothing mm full intellectual everything but so the opportunities for verbal communication are still there so we did things together we kept a blog together an extended blog um, that a lot of people told us they read and um, found very important in understanding how one could respond to this. Right. We also tried to um, avoid that grief that involved self-blame for mistakes. Um, yeah, I didn't understand about what difference it made in what facility he was um, kept. And he was in, the, in a, a hospital or a long-term care facility for uh, about two years and the one he went to had less good physical therapy than this other one might have made a difference in whether any function was ever regained so try not to dwell on your mistakes recognize them but don't dwell on them don't look back the only looking back I permitted myself was um, because we'd traveled so much, we got travel brochures from everywhere. We never traveled with any of those countries uh, companies, but because we always traveled on our own, but just the same, these brochures would come in and I allowed myself to make a pile of them mm -hmm. under a desk in the front room, right? Because my sense was we had already been to either those places or something pretty much like them all over the world because we had traveled so much and it had so much fun. So that's my one concession to looking back. Hmm. Um, but otherwise, no. Uh, then there's a, a, also an enormous amount of stress. After two years, he was able to come home now, of course, he's still totally paralyzed, right? Still on a ventilator. So that re requires 24-7 care by somebody trained mm -hmm. to manage a ventilator, um, do all nursing care, including pulmonary toilet, 
that means all the suctioning of secretions out of the lungs, right? No. Bowel care, that means reaching in and extracting feces. That's the way bowel care is done. Uh, and all the positioning and turning and feeding and arranging the feeding tube and all these other things. So because every biological function has to be performed for him. So we had a staff of 12 that um, that we hired that were first ones were trained by the hospital and then they trained each other. And of course I knew how to do all these things too. And so you look for the bright parts of this. Here's somebody who requires 24 seven care. Almost none of this is covered by insurance. This is all out of pocket. Of course. The, the financial challenges are substantial. We have to outwit the system here in, in figuring out how to cover this. Um, but the positive parts, and this had started when he was in the hospital and also at home, here's a huge grown man. He was 6'5", and he was, he was, he was a great looking guy. He was big, he was strong, he was, he wasn't, he wasn't overly muscular, but he was a pleasing human specimen, right? <laughs> well, here he is immobile in bed. Mm -hmm. But he'd always been a person who was more interested in other people than himself. That was just the kind of person he was, one reason he was so interested. He never had to advertise himself. He never had to, he never tried to prove he was better than anybody else. If you met a, at a party, you would discover that you were talking about you instead of his talking about him. It's the kind of person. Well, in the hospital, in the, in the especially in the long-term care place, uh, what some of the nurses there said, we love being around him because he's the only patient in this hospital who isn't angry about what happened to them. And in fact, what he did was to establish rapport with the nurses, the respiratory therapists, the LPNs, the everybody's who would come into his room at all hours of the day and the night. And he knew them, he knew their secrets, they could talk to him. Here was this grown, handsome, interesting man who was no threat at all because he couldn't jump out of bed, right? <laughs> he knew more about the lives of, and of course, most of the nurses were women and many of them were younger and they had the whole assortment of problems that everybody has. <laughs> and he became like a sort of surrogate father to many of the people who were So that that's another thing about grief. That's about making the best of what you have in the presence of what would otherwise be what be devastating physical. We used to say to each other, you know, this is only a tragedy if we make it that way. Hmm. This is only a tragedy if we make it that way. So we tried to not do that. We didn't think of it as a tragedy. You don't let yourself think of it as a tragedy. You think of it as something different. Yeah. So those are the coping strategies. Outsmart the usual stuff. Oh, outsmart the system. Okay. So there were people who said, well, you have to um, sell everything you have and um, you have to spend down and go on Medicaid and then um, they'll cover it. Of course, he has to be institutionalized for them to cover it. He wouldn't be able to come home. Mm. Uh, and you can keep one house, one car, and one pet. That seems to be. Well, that was just nuts. So I tried to figure out ways of being a little more.
careful. I'll tell you that story somewhere. But just to not take something like that. We um, another thing that that I did that I think was constructive, and this is still about grief. The natural response of many people when something catastrophic like that happens to a partner is to quit their job and to then dive completely into taking care of them. Hmm. Um, a, there was no way you could be the only caretaker of a person who needs 24-7 care. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and besides, I loved my job. I didn't, so I didn't quit my job. And I think that was amazingly important for both of us. That that business about the sort of self-sacrificial diving into, that um, was... Let's see. I had some little strategies for dealing with grief. Okay. So, um, I had, for some reason, I don't know how this came about, but there was, you know, I had a, my car had a little flat place on the dashboard, uh, and it also had a little slot for CDs. Not about that, right? Back in the day, CD players and cars. Back in the day, well, this car is still around. <laughs> I still I play see. CDs in it sometimes. I have a CD player in my car too. I don't use yeah. it. It's well, there. so I there was an extra disc in there, and it somehow was upside down, so that the groove side were up and the mm -hmm. label down, and sitting on the dashboard of the car. So as you drive around and the sun comes in the car, you know, windshield, it makes different colors of lights. Mm -hmm. So I came to see this as a permitted fiction. Okay, I have no, still don't, and didn't ever have a belief in an afterlife. But after he died, and we'll get to that point in a minute. It seemed to me that when the sun was reflecting on this disc and glowing red, that means good, good, right? And then if you turn a corner and the sun came at a different angle, it might be green. And that also meant good, good, right? I'm with you, right? And if you turned a little another angle, it would be blue or yellow because it has all the rainbow colors that it reflects. And that disc became a fictional, a permitted, a self-permitted fiction about uh, communication. Mm -hmm. It's also part of grief, right? about being able to continue the contact with somebody you've lost. So I think if I had advice here is allow yourself little exceptions to your, well, I don't know, allow yourself to embellish your sense of, of continuing contact, even if you don't think it's real. So any, you know, any unusual light phenomenon will do that. Yeah. And now I can say things like, hi, Brokor, thanks for mm -hmm. sending me this reflection, even though I don't believe the metaphysics of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And maintaining that connection comes up in, in grief work a lot or in the writings about it. Right, I bet, yeah. Yeah, maintaining the connection, even if the, the relationship changes, you can continue to have a relationship to that person. Yeah. And my, the thing that I take primarily from this whole experience is the this continuing sense of having been loved. So um, developmental psychologists say that the um, nature of the child parent child bond during early childhood is enormously important if you are loved 
that's great. If you're not, it's way more difficult for you at your later life. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me also that being loved in middle age, even if the connection is discontinued for a reason like this, is important for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. So I, I still um, respond to that sense of being loved and also, of course, loving in return. It's a very, a very um, prominent feature of my later life. So I don't whine about what I've lost. I try to think about how, what I still have. Mm. It doesn't mean I don't miss him. Of course I do. But it's a way of trying to make something positive from the grief that occurs. Okay, so I think we might be getting towards the end here. So I have time if you have time. Well, I wanted to talk because I've talked about, I think, everything that seems to me to be relevant um, about grief, about what it's like to go through these stages. I think I didn't talk about um, Brooke's death. You didn't and then after that, I have a little con concluding. So here's Brooke. He said early on, he was so glad he'd been rescued. Hmm. Uh, and he said that to the, the, the flight nurse who had been jogging down the canyon off duty. We tried and tried and tried to find her. And it took us about no, four months, maybe six months to find her because HIPAA is so prevalent mm -hmm. everywhere. And you can find out you know, any details until you finally find a friend who was a doc in the right department. He said, uh, give me the afternoon, I'll find out, <laughs> which he did. All right. So she came to visit him in the hospital mm. because, of course, she didn't know what had happened to him either, presumably. Right. And he said, I am so glad. Thank you so much for rescuing me. And she said, I've never known whether I did the right thing. Mm. I knew what was in store for you, a life of total paralysis. Would I have just kept on jogging? Nobody would know. Hmm. But she could have done, right? I mean, a little crowd gathers, but they don't know that she's a fully trained flight nurse, right? right? She could have kept on jogging down the hill. He would have done like any other bad bicycle accident, and that would have been that. I had a friend at the time who's she'd been hiking with her husband in southern Utah, and he had slipped on a mossy rock as they were hiking over some higher precipice, fell and died in her arms. So we used to um, have these conversations about which one of us was better off. She, her husband had died on the spot, and mine had not died had been physically um, completely disabled, but was still alive. And we had these conversations over five years. She maintained that she was better off, and I maintained that I was better off. And of course, that's just coming to terms with what is. Hmm. Anyway, after about uh, five years, his life was physically really arduous. The amount of care, the effort required to go anywhere, do anything. And we had, you know, we had a great big um, wheelchair and we had a van that would accommodate it. We did try to do this and that. We did, were able to go to the out of doors some of the time, but everything was physically hard and there was lots of pain. Lots and lots of pain. 
And after about five years, he said, they, they had actually said this years before and made preparation. I can't do this anymore. And, you know, because I'd always worked on end of life issues in my academic life and we talked about it a lot. Mm. He knew that he had the legal right to have anything, any treatment discontinued. So by this time he had a cardiac facer, he had a diaphragm facer that would assist with breathing. He had a supplemental oxygen, he had a ventilator, and he had a feeding tube. So he knew that he was within his legal rights to discontinue any of those. So he went to see his doctor. <laughs> the, this is the spinal cord doc, who in an age of 15 minute clinic visits, which were pretty much the standard, spent at least three hours with him. He was making a formal request to have his ventilator and all the other stuff discontinued. He had, we, as to arrange it so that the family or two kids were with us and two of his caregivers. And he'd um, engineered a letter, this was lo as long as a year before, saying, uh, if I die or if I if something is discontinued, I want nobody held responsible. This is my choice. And he'd had every one of the caregivers sign it, every one of the family members. And he'd had his physician sign it. Mm -hmm. It was the year before, right? Anyway, so he went. He made this formal request. Uh, he was, we were there three hours. We were uh -huh. trying to be sure that this was a genuine request. He spent time with Brooke alone, also with the family. With the family was, he was really, and then he said, "I'll, I'll let you know tomorrow." what I can do. And of course, you know that what he's doing is calling, you know, the legal department to see whether this is. Um, so he finally said, well, I'll refer you to hospice for remove discontinuation of the um, ventilator, which he did. And, um, It was not easy mm. to lie in bed with him as the ventilator was discontinued, dialed down, and now the breaths get further and further between. But it was clearly what he wanted. Mm. You can see that grief is still with me as I talk about it. Of course, yeah. yeah. Mm. So, anyway. I think you have to honor the well considered and um, understandable wishes of somebody you love. In the meantime, there had been quite a lot of publicity about this. The mm -hmm. uh, New York Times had done a very large piece that appeared in the Sunday magazine. It was this was not too long after that. This was 2013. Anyway, so I think I'm coming to the end of what I might have to say, Desiree, but I, said, I think the final thing I've thought about is because in grief, both in the first case and, and in the second one, you want to be aware of how you're acting and responding. And, you can see there are, there are already some voluntary things like don't look back, don't mm -hmm. forget what you've lost. Think about what you can make out of the present, what you have. Um, don't just follow the standard ways of doing things. But I got to thinking about the stages of grief. Isn't it what denial, bargaining, what happens next? Anger, yeah. Oh, anger denial, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Acceptance. Uh, 
uh, and as I understand it, those are adopted from people um, responding originally to blindness. To mm. blind. But anyway, th those are the standard things, and people respond to this. And I said, you know what? Those don't seem to connect with my experience. I'm going to make up my own. So I have five stages of grief also. Uh, and they all happen to start with S. Mm -hmm. So here they are. Forget that, you know, anger. Mm -hmm. Forget the bargaining. Here they are. There's shock. Right, that's at the time of the initial accident. Then comes sorrow. Sorrow comes, and these aren't distinct phases. They, you know, interact, interfuse with each other. Sorrow can be howling. It can be absolutely quiet, but it's intense. Then comes seclusion. And seclusion is a state in which you retreat just like a wounded animal in a corner. You still do all the things you have to do. You have to go to this meeting, you have to teach that class, you have to arrange these things about whatever it is, but you're emotionally secluded. Mm. And that can go on for quite a long time. I, I think it's often conflated with depression, but it's not at all the same thing. It's just you don't initiate things. You don't you you're in seclusion, I think is the only way that I can think of to describe it. So that's the third of the S stages. Then that elides into solitude. And solitude is different from seclusion. Solitude is still solitary, but it's not pathological, it's not bad. It's just solitude. And there are things that, about solitude that are. Mm -hmm. And then finally, the last stage, and I, it seems to me you can only be in this some of the time because it's not stable, is serenity. In which you say, I really treasure these things from my life. Try to have made the best of them. And they're still operative in your life. But you're calm about it now. Mm. Kind of serene. So, shock, sorrow, seclusion, solitude, serenity. And so it seems to me that those are the stages that I've experienced. And for anybody else out there, dealing with grief, my advice is make up your own. Yeah. Don't just listen to the official stages. Make up your own. It seems, yeah, it seems that there's, there's been, uh, there's been some moving on from Kubler-Ross. Uh, I think somewhat, God, I, I read about all, all about this last summer. Um, I think in it, th there was a sixth stage added, and then some people were like, meh. So. But, but there the assumption well, is that everybody's, everybody's route through grieving is the same. Yeah. There's no reason to think that at all. Right? Mm -hmm. There might be some similarities from the intensity of the initial grief, depending on, you know, it, you know there are different courses and different reasons for grief. So somebody who's partner is slowly, slowly, slowly evolving into, um, say, Alzheimer's. 
there's not the same acute stage at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and more difficulty at the end. That's, that's a different pattern. So it seems to me that our job as people who lose, we lose people that we care about. That's part of human life, unless we're the ones that that to recognize that these are different circumstances, different losses, we're different people. Mm -hmm. and, um, think about it for yourself, I think. It's I, well, I'm interested in, in the idea of the good death because I feel like you were the one who introduced me to the idea. And I always, because I didn't know about your mom and I knew after I met you, and I met you in 2014. Um, my, someone had given me, it must have been Kara who introduced us. I think she, she must have told me to Google you. And so I remember seeing back then the New York Times piece, which I feel, if I recall, had a video. There was a video w with it, yeah. Uh -huh. and I got to see Brooke, you know, yeah. in at near the end, um, but, you know, in, in life. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and I think that was around the time when I got introduced to the idea. But I always um, I always thought you know this was a collision of your life and your work. I wrote, and I mean, yeah, I wrote a piece called "The Irony of Supporting Physician Assisted Suicide." <laughs> it was called in those days. Isn't this ironic? Who should this happen to? It could be. Yeah. Yeah. I should send you that piece because it's actually kind of interesting. Oh, yeah. Is it? Was, can I find it easily online? Uh, yeah. It's it's called The Irony of Supporting Physician, of Supporting Physician Assisted Suicide. I think it was published in some bioethics journal. Okay. I'll look it up. Yeah. Um, and if you can't find it, I can. Okay. Yeah, because... Um, I always thought of it as, as a collision, but then it's almost kind of like an echo, right? Or a, d a different kind of echo, maybe? If it started with mom. Well, yeah, of course, lots of people use, lose their mothers at early ages. But, I mean, it's a different kind of echo. I mean, before that, what's the previous uh, occasion for grief? It's when your pet gets run over. Mm. Mm -hmm. Your dog dies, your pet gets, your cat gets run over those things. In fact, some people say they get pets for their kids because they want them to be oh. familiar with, you know, this experience. Of <laughs> but yeah. that idea of, of the good death or being able to make a choice started with your mom, that thought process. I think so. Yeah. I, I don't think it was entirely conscious at first. Right. Yeah. That you, you it's in the back of your mind. Mm -hmm. You know, how could this have been different or better? Yeah. As I say I have no idea of what she would have chosen. Mm -hmm. She was a smart person. She was a thoughtful person. She had a PhD in mathematical economics, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but so, then you know the idea that she should just be handled in a standard way. Mm. But it's probably thinking about would there have been alternatives for her? Mm. What what alternative would she have wanted? Encourage my own thinking in any situation like this about thinking through alternatives. So um, I guess I forgot to mention the little bit about all, all the ways you try to skirt what's standard. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just want to hear about, um, I guess, more about how. Well, yeah, I'm thinking I'm thinking of what I like what I'm conceptualizing as the echo of it starting with your mom and then wondering if she could have had a choice and then eventually coming back to Brooke and, and having him, you know, him being able to have a choice sort right. of despite all of these the obstacles. He did have, I think that's actually a nice thread to draw through this story. Mm -hmm. That thinking about 
thinking about one's mother having a choice that that is her choice rather than your choice or the doctor's choice or any of that work. And thinking that even though I don't know how she would have made it, that I would have had to respect it. And of course that's writ much larger with Brooke mm -hmm. because she was dying anyway. There was nothing and of course, the, the cancer treatments available at the time were much more. She, she'd already had a major surgery that was tried to stop this. And there really was nothing else to do. Um, so that's a kind of choice that one can imagine. And that I think was actually done a fair amount in those days. Hmm. So there's, but but there was never. You couldn't talk about death and dying. Mm -hmm. so you couldn't ever reflect on how you'd like your death to go. If you had a choice, if you had your brothers. Yep. And and so the direct line from that to recognizing right off the bat that Brooke would have a choice. He only didn't have a choice about whether to be resuscitated at the time of the accident because I wasn't there. Of course, he couldn't have made a choice. Well, let's see. We both had living wills that said no tubes, no machines, no whatevers. And had, had he, had that been available at the time of the accident, of course, he's out in his biking clothes. He had no identification. They didn't know who he was. Um, so he was taken to the hospital as an unidentified patient. Wow. And uh, I think the only way they figured out eventually who he was was by the police got his bicycle and traced the bicycle back to where it had been purchased and by whom it had been purchased. Wow. Huh. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. So when I came home that afternoon, there was a policeman standing at the front door. And you knew from his, and there were, of course, a few little neighbors around, you knew from the posture of the policeman that something terrible, from the fact that there was a policeman there, that something terrible had happened. But you could also tell he wasn't dead. Hmm. And it was, yeah, I don't know how, what what it was about this policeman's body language, but anyway, interesting. That's when the shock begins, right? Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm thinking about. I've I well I'm I'm so I feel like you must have seen the movie How to Die in Oregon. I certainly have. Yeah, I, one of my favorite movies. Um, and I'm thinking about that last scene, you know, with the with the mother, and all you see is the window shot through the window, right? So beautiful, but you hear the audio, and right, I, I get chills just thinking about it. Yeah, I met that um, that uh, filmmaker really here in town. Uh, I can't remember how many years ago, and I think I was on a panel. I think this was at BYU. This is long enough ago, so I've forgotten the details. But there was ample time to discuss with him about how he'd done it and why. And that was the family's request that there not be cameras mm -hmm. in the room. Mm -hmm. But that, the, and I thought that was a brilliant solution. It really was. Yeah, brilliant. Um, but I, you know, I compare. I, 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 I always have that in my mind when I'm thinking through this idea of you know, medically assisted dying, um, when it comes to people who have been struggling with, with their, um, their mental health or whatever for, for a long time, um, and legalizing, uh, this for people, you know, just, just giving people agency across the board with their death. I think about that scene all the time. And of course, you know, this is the, the, the most ideal hypothetical, that's right, because it's the loving family 
the devoted physician, the um, mm -hmm. understanding um, parapatsi who are not being invasive, mm -hmm. the, um, the history that she, that she's agreed to already by having been uh, filmed over this long period of time leading up to that. Yeah. And little details like getting her hair done, mm -hmm. just beforehand, you think, what? And she did have the most fabulous hair of anybody in film ever, right? <laughs> it's true. You know, what? I, I love that. I love that movie. What could it be like? You know, what could it be like to choose to make that choice? Um, in well, the it's, yeah, it's now legal in, as of uh, two days ago. Um, but seven? No, 12. Uh, well, whatever the, you mean, it, there are 10 states now that recognize this. And the one that was just added, wait, let me think. Mm, Oregon, Washington, Vermont. Um, Montana doesn't have a statute, but it has a Supreme yeah. Court decision. Um, California, Col Colorado, Maine, New Jersey, uh, and I think I've forgotten one or two, and one just added two days ago. What was it? New Mexico. New Mexico. Oh. Wasn't D.C. one of them? I feel like. D.C. is one of them. Of course, it's not a state just yet. Yeah. yeah. I've uh yeah I, I looked this up fairly recently so it's funny that it comes up but oh that's that's good to know uh so that covers at least twenty two probably twenty five percent of the U S population mm -hmm. and there are a number more that are sort of on the brink Massachusetts uh, Connecticut's in uh, before the legislature right now really? or is whether it's likely to, it's taken seven years to get out of committee but. Yeah. The fact that it did, though, or that it might. Yeah, it's out of committee. It's, you know, it's before the legislature that, you know, this is a Catholic oh. state that's not likely that it'll pass. But, mm -hmm. but, uh, but think also globally. So um, the Netherlands, Belgium, uh, Luxembourg, um, there have been revisions of the or court decisions in uh, Austria. Mm -hmm. um, which like Germany, where suicide's been not illegal since the time of Frederick the Great, mm -hmm. provided the person is in control of their own will and is not pushed by anybody else. And uh, two things, not pushed by anybody else and not you know, mentally um, deranged, I guess you'd say. Um, Spain has just voted in favor, Portugal really? against. Spain, Spain, and uh, it's legal in, oh, also um, Victoria, Australia, and West Australia is, is coming on in the 21st of July, I think, or June, uh, and all of Canada. Oh, I didn't realize that it, it was, but this is only in, in well, not, not internationally, in terms of both Belgium and Denmark and what, what are the limitations? So we've got, you know, terminal illness here. Mm -hmm. So all the rest of those, well, I'm not sure it's fair to say all the rest. So here we require terminal illness. That's defined as expected to die within six months. But there's no um, requirement. You have to be an adult. You have to be a resident. You have to be, you have to make a certain number of requests. Um, there's a waiting period. There's mm -hmm. it's different in different places, um, uh, and in the U.S. you have to self-administer under mm -hmm. most of our laws. They all also specify that this is not to be um, uh, understood as a, as a suicide or as euthanasia or as mercy killing or um, in some states mentioned elder abuse. This is not elder abuse. Um, but all the other places, so Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, those are, are the original ones. They don't require terminal illness, but they do require intolerable suffering. Mm -hmm. And 
that cannot be relieved by any means acceptable to the patient. So, and they permit, um, there's been lots of discussion of this, uh, they permit um, psychiatric suffering without physical suffering. Mm -hmm. I mean, as if those two things could be distinguished, but, but I mean, that's a separate issue. It is, however, extremely rare. It requires mm -hmm. um, much heightened uh, levels of scrutiny. Yeah, I remember there was a lot of coverage of, of uh, the case of a 24-year-old. I think they were calling her Laura several years ago. The name I don't remember. And there was one very peculiar case, right? Uh, and then in Belgium, there was the case of the twins. The twins were, they were adult men. And I don't remember how old they were. Uh, they were adult, but not young. I remember it as maybe late 30s, 40s, 50s, something like that. Mm. And they were, they were identical twins, I think. They were twins. Uh, and they were, it was about blindness and deafness. And they were already either blind or deaf. I can't remember which one. But the, they were both going the other one as well. I mm. think maybe they were both blind, but not deaf both, you know, because they're identical, they're losing function in, unsurprisingly in the same way, both going deaf. Mm -hmm. or maybe I've got it the other way around. And they jointly elected um, euthanasia. And you think, who, on the other hand, that what are their... Kind of nice. What, what are their prospects if they are both blind and deaf? Mm -hmm. and uh, so it's not like Helen Keller, you know, developing strategies for living without, you know, from early on. Right. They, they have each other, but if they can no longer communicate either with vision or with speech, hmm. what does that mean? Right. right. So then that almost leads back to the able the idea of ableism i have have you had those conversations about ableism sure yeah um with uh you know so obviously i've for a long time been on the side of let me make my choice um but ableism has been a huge gap in my knowledge and it's something i've had to work toward but and and so i hear um disability advocates saying like, no, 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 we don't want this because doctors will offer our own death to us because it's easier. Well, that's the claim. So then we want to look at the data. Hard a little. We want to look at the data. So an early study, you can see my dander getting up a little bit. An early study, I believe this is 1997. I should be able to remember this and I'll tell you why in a minute. Compa looks at the data in the two places where it was legal at the time. Oregon and the Netherlands mm. looked at uh, 12, uh, sorry, 10, um, what were um, identified as vulnerable groups. And all the, all the um, medical societies said, no, 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 we can't do this because think about the impact on people with disabilities, people who have low SES, people with um, uh, low educational status, people with who are um, minorities, um, people who are, uh, have, um, what else, mental illness, people who are elderly, um, and I think there were 10 groups all together. You can look it up. It's mm -hmm. Did you find it? Oh, no, I'm going to look it up. I'm just making notes. Oh, okay. Well, if you want to look it up, it's called, um, uh, look up impact, the impact. Okay, I'll give it away. The first author is one certain Batin. <laughs> this is how I know about it. But this is a, actually a famous paper and really important. You are the mo one of the mothers of bioethics, I hear. <laughs> well, that's uh, some group designated that. And of, of all the things on my Vita, that's probably the most useful. 
Oh, here we go. Legal physician assisted dying. Oh, no, that's 2007 in Oregon and the Netherlands. Evidence concerning the impact on patients in vulnerable group. Vulnerable group. Is it really 2007? Uh-huh. Oh, how about that? How about it? You lost a whole decade. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> well, ah, uh, look at that. Margaret P. Batten, right? I know that one. Yeah. So this really is an interesting paper. So uh, wait a minute. Oops. Go, go back. Let's look at the authors again. Agnes von der Heide and Brechia only to Aka Philipson and Ferret van der Waal. They're all Dutch. Uh, and um, Ferret van der Waal was the, the guy in charge of all the information that was collected by the Dutch, um, whatever it is, Bureau of, you know, Department of Health about uh, assisted, assisted suicide, it was called, or euthanasia is what it's usually called in the Netherlands. Mm. And Linda Gansini is the data person in Oregon. Okay. So we've got, and this started because I was, you know, there, there were all these accusations about the impact on vulnerable groups. I was walking down the street one day with uh, Thunderwall, and I said something about, you know, because this guy had all the data in his head. Well, you know, what about the impact on people? you know, minorities and, you know, people with disabilities and people who are, um, you know, not educated. And he, I remember he stopped in the street and he turned around and sort of looked at me and he said, I never thought about that. So here's a guy with all the data in his head. So what you understand is there is not an issue about this in the Netherlands, right? At mm -hmm. least that the data shows. So then we got together. Um, I, I'm the ringleader of a lot of things, and it's the most fun stuff in the world. <laughs> Good. So, so uh, we looked at these 10 groups, and for Oregon and the Netherlands, mm -hmm. uh, for the elderly, oh, it was also said that it would bear especially um, uh, heavily on women. Somebody made her whole career out of this claim, you know, because women are so delicate mm -hmm. and so easily pushed around. Um, people without insurance, that's not true in the Netherlands because everybody is insured, as in any sensible country. Uh, and people with AIDS were a special category because at that time, AIDS was still very highly stigmatized. Mm -hmm. And then people with low SES, um, uh, the poor, um, racial and ethnic minorities, and people with chronic physical or, or mental disabilities, or chronic non-terminal illnesses, and kids, uh, and people with psychiatric illness, including um, physician uh, depression and Alzheimer disease. And here's all the breakdown of all of this. So I think there's a, a um, little chart later on, a little later on. And here's what we found mm -hmm. about whether there's evidence of heightened risk in these groups. Uh, AIDS. There is no, AIDS was the only one where people were more likely than the background population to have had. Mm -hmm. A lot of that had to do with um, um, physicians and other clinicians who themselves had AIDS because there was this whole ethic of helping each other. Mm -hmm. It's a terrible disease with yeah. a really horrible end. And mm -hmm. everybody in the affected community knew that. In the gay community. Yeah. So, yeah. Because they were watching their friends die, right? Right. So um, that's no longer true with AIDS. Of course, AIDS is now much more treatable. Mm -hmm. and we even have a cure. I mean, we've given it to two people, but we have we have what? We have a cure for it. A cure? Mm-hmm. Well, we're developing something that we I don't know whether it's a, it will be a cure for everybody. There's still it's still right. a huge global epidemic. Yeah. There's something going on because I know that I feel like it was a cure administered to only two people though, and I right. can't remember 
exactly what the circumstances are. a little bit of a bell. I thought it had to do with people with some particular genetic um, distinctiveness. Anyway, it doesn't make any difference. But here's, the, so this is another direct product of the same thing. So here are all these claims about this will be, you know, fall on the minorities and fall on the, you know, poor people and fall on people with disabilities. And the evidence is just the other way around. So if you go to the very last um, paragraph, I think it's here. Mm -hmm. The evidence available can't provide conclusive proof and blah, blah, blah. And it's very, you know, because the data is um, putting it together. All these people, except me, were sophisticated um, um, analysts of data. And how to, they're all epidemiologists. Um, mm -hmm. The joint picture yielded by the available data in these two jurisdictions, people who died with a physician's assistance were more likely, and here's the bottom line, to be members of groups enjoying comparative social, economic, educational, professional, and other privileges. Mm. So this is rich, white people, males and females in equal proportions. And as it was said informally to me, these are people who are used to getting their way. There were jokes made in Oregon about it. It's our doctors and lawyers who get this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they're not disadvantaged, right? It's, it's the people who've always been privileged and are used to being privileged and know how to navigate things to get this, right? So, interesting. isn't that interesting? But it's about yeah. set out to challenge the assumptions that are involved in claims like that. Yeah. So, anyway. Would you replicate it? Would you do it again? Do you think there's... Oh, this would be a huge amount of work to do it again. And of course, now there are um, uh, so many more jurisdictions where it's legal. Somebody who had a lot of money that this was done with no money. There was no grant support. Mm -hmm. Why not? Why waste your time writing a grant proposal when you could just do the work, right? <laughs> and um, if you had world enough in time, you could try to do this um, for every jurisdiction where it's great. But the fact that the opposition has by and large stopped tooting this horn mm. I mean, they haven't completely stopped. And then there are some really ignorant folks out there. Well, um, might not be what the data shows, but we know it's going on underground, right? Hmm. Or stuff like that. Or it could happen. Or it will happen, right? That's right. slippery slope kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah, I have, I've wondered about that. I, I hate the thought that, you know, that that would happen. I, I initially... Um, kind of likened the argument almost to the organ donor argument. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, if we allow organ donation, then people will be off. That happens apparently in some countries. Um, yeah. Uh, Something about people being dragged off for, is this Pakistan or somewhere like that? Hmm. I can't remember. Afghanistan, who knows? I don't know. Um, you know, they wake up in bathtubs in hotel rooms with kidney missing. But Sounds like uh, plenty of horror movies I've seen for sure. Yeah. Um, so I guess here's here's a question that I honestly had never, I don't even know how I had never made the connection before. And it's the last thing because I know you need to go do a walk. Um, talk to me about Jack Kevorkian. That was the first time I feel like kind of, well, in my life that I know of that this idea was talked about in, you know, culture. Um, and it was, you know, people hated it. Well, he certainly got the biggest press, no doubt about it. I don't and know exactly what he did. I haven't checked. I haven't read up he, on it. He, he, his first case was a gal named, I think, Janet Atkins, I think, or Atkins. Uh, and she was... I think, uh, let's see, you could probably look it up, Janet Adkins. 
And um, she had what were understood as the beginnings of Alzheimer's. And her particular complaint was that she couldn't keep track of the score when they were playing tennis. Mm-hmm. I think something like that. I might have the details confused. So he rigged up his Volkswagen van with something called the Mercitron. And it was some kind of contraption with vials or, you know, lethal medications. And so I- the patient had to push the lever. He'd rig up a, an IV and the patient uh, would push the lever and that would be it. And I think he, he did this. I think there were something like a hundred cases. You probably better read up. Wikipedia will tell you all about him. Yeah, I want a New York Times article about it right now. Oh, okay. Uh, and he did this something like a hundred times and it was brought up. This was in um, Michigan, I think. Isn't that right? Uh, where this was clearly not a violation of the law. Detroit, yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, but then he finally did it on TV where he administered the lethal medication. That's when he was convicted. But he did things like appear in court in some kind of jester's costume or 18th century dress or something like that. <laughs> did all these stunts. And I think he was actually served the right to die movement well by being the outlier. Mm-hmm. That made, you know, conscientious, you know, careful physicians like Tim Quill, who was just on the same course yesterday, mm-hmm. uh, who wrote a piece in the New England Journal about giving a prescription for a medication to his patient, a uh, cancer patient, mm-hmm. take it herself later on, which is just miles away from what Kevorkian was up to. Right. So it made something like Quill seem normal, mm-hmm. acceptable, because Kevorkian was so far out on the fringes. No, I mean, I have to, I I guess it's good that I never even tried, like, in, the connection never came to me before. Um, of Kevorkian? Yeah. I mean, we're, you know, we're talking, we've been talking about this for years, and never once have I thought of Jack Kevorkian when thinking about end of life issues or being able to make a choice. Well, there, I mean, there are all kinds of bizarro things out there in the world. There are. Um, Truth. <laughs> but, but his was much more, I, I want to say it was principled. I, I know there's a movie called You Don't Know Jack. Mm. You Don't Know Jack right mm-hmm. How we would ordinarily pronounce that and i i understand it's a pretty good movie and i mean to watch it sometime Noted. It. it's on my list of about the hundred movies i'd most like to see right that i never got around to <laughs> i'm gonna go look it up in a little while um yeah hey we should watch it together right yeah we could do that for suicide stuff and provide commentary and drink there we uh, go. <laughs> I thought of one more question. Okay, good. The language piece. I'm I'm from when your mom died and and up until mm-hmm. as you said Kubla Ross uh, put out her book. I'm thinking of um, when I feel a lot like I you don't know what you don't know. I feel like that comes up. That's such a theme in my life right now. So you don't know to ask the questions or you don't, if you don't have the, uh, I think in the the Bible and in early writings, we didn't have the color green or the color blue. So everything was wine colored. I think the ocean was wine colored. Um, I don't know about this, right? Fel told me about it, but we didn't, I think it was, I think it was green. So in Cambodia, they still don't have the word a word for green, and everything is that's green is described as blue, and essentially how this has evolved as we've we've learned more about you know things like color and perception. Um, but that not not having the words to describe losing someone to describe grief to just how. <laughs> 
my question is how how did you how do you get through that you mean not having words for something yeah not having the words for grief for for having a doctor or your mom or your family be able to say you know she's she's dying and and maybe processing it in advance or how did you know how did it work with processing it after any well, any we communicate without adequate words all the time so prior to kubler ross kubler ross was the one that made it okay to talk about dying mm. so it was you know it was just a taboo subject you didn't talk about it and the prevailing uh, there's data about whether physicians of that time would tell a patient the um a fatal prognosis mm -hmm. that they were dying answer about 90 percent of them said they wouldn't mm -hmm. and those figures have entirely reversed now so mm -hmm. 90 or more than 90 percent say they would right well this is just part of that cultural period um but of course even though nobody would say it and you couldn't talk about it, that doesn't mean you didn't know it. Mm. So of course the doctor knew it. Even though he says something like, you'll be up and around by spring, the prevailing thing was pre preserve hope. So mm -hmm. that's what he thought he was doing, even though he knew perfectly well that that wasn't going to happen. Uh, and the patient understood because she's the one experiencing it, right? And she knows, you know, about the surgeries and this and the, that. Uh, the family know it because we're around, right? Mm -hmm. And everybody else knows it as well because, of course, everybody in the world dies and we watch them go through these processes. And so that that isn't happening here it wasn't a myth you you could you know entertain mm -hmm. even though you can't talk about it oh dear the sun just went i need to go out there pretty soon um yeah, what time is what time does the sun go down for you right now it's not the sun going down it's the clouds coming in so oh let me just check the weather to see what the because this is you know mountain territory and so it's, i don't know what's all going on so now it's showing cloudy. The question is, will it is rain forecast? But mm. uh, it, that doesn't mean it couldn't happen. I it's don't want to actually forecast until tomorrow. Uh, when t what's forecast for tomorrow is snow. <laughs> <sighs> right here, right now, it's forty six degrees, mm. and tomorrow it's supposed to snow. <laughs> tomorrow god well if you want to go you go go take your jog <laughs> <laughs> i should do that pretty soon and um let me do one well never mind so um this is fun we could keep doing this right i mean yeah we could we could do whatever we want we could come back to it yeah yeah all right is there any more another question to Ask. No, I was just curious about about that, um, just that experience. Not know, you know, how do you how do you get through it if you can't talk about it or write about it or you know? Yeah, well, I think it's like many other things um, that we can't talk about or haven't been able to talk about. I mean, take just to take a, an example. Let's talk about human sexuality. We weren't supposed to talk about that either, right? So everybody knew everything. Mm -hmm. I remember that I, my mother taught piano in her later years. So I had to take piano lessons, of course. And it, it became evident to everybody that I was not going to be the next Cassidy Sue, they always said. That was because I spent most of my time kicking the face of the piano, you know, because I didn't want to practice. <laughs> anyway, so I, an arrangement was made so that, all right, okay, you don't have to take classical piano anymore. But we know of a teacher 
who's really great. He teaches barroom piano. Oh my God. But that was really hot. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. So I could um, go and take the streetcar, you know, a couple miles to his house, walk to the streetcar, take the streetcar, uh, and get off and walk to his house. And uh, he taught piano at home. Mm -hmm. uh, and I did that for a number of years. It was just great. He was a wonderful teacher. And I, I got given up at playing. So I played the piano when I was at college in the dormitory for all these lovesick, you know, college students. But here's what was never talked about. The piano teacher was uh -huh. So that was whispered among my parents' friends. Do you know she's letting her daughter go off to this gay man's house? And his partner is in the house? <laughs> and of course, it was never, it was never openly discussed. It was never whispered, but you couldn't say it publicly. You couldn't discuss it at dinner, for instance. You couldn't talk to me about it. Um, because I was a child, you know, mm -hmm. they were pretty progressive, so they didn't think this was a problem at all. But there were plenty of other parents. That's an example of something else that, um, from the days of closetedness, mm -hmm. where people on the inside understand this, but it just isn't able to be a matter of public thought right anyway there of course they're not entirely parallel because um, there are lots of different circumstances but anyway it's that kind of mm -hmm. not having public language mm -hmm. you know, lots of public language and we've, we're much more aware of a whole array of differences in human sexuality and now we have labels for everything and if this acronym gets any longer, <laughs> it's very next T. No, no T. No, I think it's been, you know, it's, it's very long. It's very long, and it's and chances are it'll get longer. It so, still doesn't encompass, you know, the the vast array of of orientations. No, so it's um, so, but that's clearly some, a piece of language I think that's got to be in transition because it's mm -hmm. and all the things like they as a pronoun makes some pieces of language impossible to understand because you can't tell whether you're talking about one person or several people that that somehow needs to get fixed mm. yeah I think there's, there's just this. so I mean so the point is <laughs> we have ways of understanding each other that are imperfect but it's not a matter of language mm -hmm.